Hey Bible class, Pastor Sam here to continue our series on the book of Matthew. Uh, it's good to be back in adult ed. In the book of Matthew, we're in, in, in chapter 8 today, verses 1 through 13. We've taken, it's been since October that we started this book. We made it through the first seven chapters, so we're on uh, track to finish this whole thing before, you know, 2025 or something like that. Let's do a few verses today, though. Now, I said 8 through 13, 8, 1 through 13. This is in two sections, as you see here. Uh, verses 1 through 4, verse 5 through 13 next. And so if you turn with me to the, to the beginning, uh, verse 1 of chapter 8. This verse could be said to be the end of the Sermon on the Mount narrative. Uh, which would be reasonable because we read when he came down from the mountainside, uh, meaning this is the end of that, that section, or the beginning of this new narrative, the beginning of Jesus' interactions with the crowds, the beginning of Jesus doing some things he hasn't done, done so clearly yet in the book of Matthew, and, 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 of course, and Jesus really kind of putting into practice the authority that he's just taught about. That's an important thing to remember. At the very end of, of chapter 7, we read, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Then we read, When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing. He said, be clean. And Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now Jesus has done some healing in the book of Matthew. At the very end of chapter 4, right before the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes around healing people, but we don't have the interaction of a healing yet. And this is a really incredible one because of who he's healing and because of what he says and because of the whole context of who's around and things like that. Now, uh, the, the first kind of character we have in this is, uh, other than Jesus, is this character of the crowds. And I want to just take a step back, and maybe actually we'll do a different color for this. Um, we'll do, thing, do this this way. So we have Jesus, uh, who goes up onto the mountainside to teach his disciples. So Jesus there is in red. And his disciples, whatever number that is, we don't actually know. Uh, come alongside him. And so we just, let's just say we've got some people there. I think they're actually sitting, but uh, we'll do it like this. These are the disciples. Um, and, uh, you know, they're around Jesus learning in this Sermon on the Mount. That's who we're told in, in, in chapter uh, 5, that's, or chapter 4, that's who we're told goes with Jesus um, to, to learn on the mountainside, but the crowds come too. And so there's this other character that's all around them, and that is this character that is the crowds. And i got to do this a little more quickly. Uh, but there's crowds all around. Um, these people are not disciples. And what's the difference between one who's a disciple and one who's not? Disciples are learning and adhering from Jesus. Disciples are his followers. The rest of them are just kind of there. They are indeed marveling. And as we read at the end of chapter 7, they are uh, marveling because of the authority that he teaches us. So this is kind of the image. Now, Jesus uh, comes down from the mountain. Boom. And here he is. His crowd, the crowds are going to come with him as well. But as he does this, one from the crowds emerges. And you would think this is just another crowd member, but right away we see that this one is different. One emerges and kind of, I don't know how to do a kneeling stick figure, we'll do it like this, and kneels there. The thing about the crowds in the book of Matthew is uh, they're a character of their own. Uh, they're not believers. In fact, they never kind of give us the indication that they're believers. They just kind of come, and they're there, and they marvel, and they're surprised, um, but they don't show that they believe in any, in any sort of way. And so one from the crowd emerges, but he quickly demonstrates to us that he is not the same as the rest of them. Now, if we remember back uh, in, 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 in chapter 7, verse 29, when Jesus says that he has authority, the crowds marvel not because they believe that G who Jesus is or what he says, but they marvel at his statement about his authority where he says, uh, where they, because we read, 
he doesn't teach like their teachers do. He teaches with this different kind of, of authority. And now, what we're seeing right from the beginning with this first interaction here is Jesus showing us what his authority actually looks like and what's actually happening. And so the crowds witness him teaching and saying these incredible things. Now they're going to witness what he does with this one who's different. Now this is a leper. And already, this is a different thing. This leper uh, should have been at a distance from Jesus. In fact, you've probably heard about them living in colonies outside of the towns or the villages. And that's because lepers were unclean, contagious, not actually in, in the way of like, you touch me and you get leprosy. It was, it, was, it was all about the spiritual kind of view of the whole thing. Lepers were contagious in that if they touched you or were, were near you or you touched what they were touching, you would become unclean spiritually. And so they were relegated out and away, and that's where they were supposed to be until such a time as they, they could demonstrate that they no longer had leprosy. And so right off the bat, this interaction is, 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 is tense, or, or it's, it's not what we might expect to, to read. Um, he should have been at a different distance, which is a big thing. But what's even more incredible is that he's one of the crowds, and we even read he emerges out of the crowds. And if you see, I drew him here differently because this is a leper who believes something about Jesus. He's a leper who believes in the authority that Jesus teaches with. And so he says to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now I mentioned that the, the crowds kind of have their own, their own, their own character in the book of Matthew, and there are different ways that uh, that that characters are kind of indicated, or that the kind of the, the the intent or the purpose of the belief of characters is indicated. And one of the ways that that happens in this book is by that word Lord, also by the word Rabbi, Teacher, things like that. If one is a disciple of Jesus in the book of Matthew, they will often, or maybe even always, use the word Lord to refer to him. It tells us this is a believer. And that's exactly what this leper does, is he kneels down and he says, Lord, we know this is a different kind of member of the crowd. This is not like the rest of these. If he was only a teacher to him, or only one who kind of taught with this bizarre and different sort of authority, then he would have called him rabbi or teacher. This is not what he does. He kneels, so he goes to a position of reverence, and he says, Lord. And so already, everything is different. He's not just a leper. He's a leper with faith. And, and that's a different sort of thing. Now, this interaction is really awesome because Jesus basically has a person who has a need, who has faith enough to call upon him, and Jesus immediately meets the need as it's, as it's requested. He says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing, be clean. Now, it's not just the cleanliness of the body, of course, that's happening here. It's so much more uh, in-depth than that. And so Jesus uh, reverses kind of the flow of how things happen. Remember, even though he would have been covered with boils of the leprosy or whatever it is, uh, he's unclean more, even, even more than that on a spiritual level. And Jesus responds to both of these things. He, he makes him clean because immediately he was cured of his leprosy, we read in verse 3. But he says, be clean in a way that's so much more intense than that. Uh, don't see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded, he says, as a testimony to them. In that action, in this healing of him and in what he says to him about going to the priest, we see that Jesus has reversed the flow of cleanliness. It used to be that if you touched him, if you touched a, a leper, as Jesus did here, they would communicate their uncle uncleanness to you, their uncleanliness to you. But Jesus touches him, unprecedented what he does. He touches him, and in that act, he communicates his own cleanliness to the leper. Jesus reverses the direction of how this cleanliness goes. Now, this is kind of proved to us uh, in, in what he tells him to do, in this, in this kind of bizarre ending to this little, this little section where he says, now, go, don't tell anyone, go right to the temple. See that you don't tell anyone, but instead go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses has commanded as a testimony to them. Now, why doesn't Jesus want him to tell anyone 
There could be a couple, uh, couple reasons for that. It happens at other points in, in the scriptures that Jesus says, don't tell anyone. I think it's the book of Mark. Transfiguration happens up on the mountain, and, and Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Um, uh, here he does it, and, and it's kind of, there's a couple questions, a couple reasons it could be happening as we ask the question, why doesn't Jesus want him to tell anyone? The first is that Jesus is focused on the, 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 the man's spiritual cleanliness and even his legal cleanliness in, in, the, in the law. See, Jesus, remember, told us that he did not come to abolish the law, but instead he came to fulfill the law. And so he, the requirement that he would go to the temple and make this offering and show himself clean before the priest is not something that Jesus is kind of like fundamentally against. Instead, he wants him to operate within that context, within that relationship to the law. Go, show them that you're clean because it's not just about your body. It's about your standing before God himself. And as Jesus touched him, he, of course, cleansed that standing before God himself. And so there's that one sense where he's kind of saying, and I think this is probably the most important thing, the most essential thing that's just happened, the, the thing I want you to take away, leper, from this communication with me, from this interaction, is that you called me Lord and called upon me for help, and I healed you all over. Not just here, not on your skin, but of course, I healed you in your, in, your, in your very soul. And that's something that I can do as I clean you and as I declare you to be clean. Why? Verse se chapter 7, verse 29, because I have authority. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that Jesus doesn't need our help. I mean, he, take, he uses us, to, of course, to, to spread his word throughout the world, but Jesus' actions speak for themselves. And so uh, it, it could be that Jesus is saying, don't, be, don't worry that you must go prove to everyone that I am who I say I am. I've got authority, and they're all going to know it someday. Instead, you go to where I'm sending you, which is to show yourself clean in the temple, because that is the great testimony of what God has done in this place. Now, the last thing I've got for you here is to consider what this cleanliness or uncleanliness looks like for you. In the, in the book of James, uh, verse four, or chapter 4, verse 17, we read that whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. What a reminder of our daily, daily uncleanliness before God. If we know the right thing to do and we don't do it, that's sin. And for that, we must be forgiven. And of course, that's exactly who Jesus came to be, the one who forgives that sin for us. And so the reminder that Jesus has reversed the flow of that cleanliness, uh, of how, where the cleanliness flows, he, it comes from him to us. And, and, and indeed, uh, we, we could call him our righteousness, as the scriptures do. He is our righteousness. And it, it even might be a helpful image for you to think that when God the Father looks down upon you in judgment, which he does, he sees Christ's righteousness upon you. Christ's clean, white robe of righteousness has been put on you because of your baptism. And it's no different. And in that sense, don't think that you're not the leper. Don't think that you're not the one covered in uncleanliness, relegated, who ought to be relegated out of town to a, to a faraway place because you're that far from being worthy of being in God's presence, except where Christ brings you in. He touches you when no one else would. And in that touch, because it has authority, he, he, he makes you clean. Uh, now, this couples right into the next place that we're going in, in verses 5 through 13. So let's look at those. Now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking to help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed and in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, I will go and heal him. That's what your Bible says. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it differently. Jesus said to him, shall I myself go and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and the other, and, and the one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to, the, to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places of the feast with Abraham, at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom, those under 
of some authority, those subjects under the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. Now, uh, a little bit of context here. Uh, maybe you know this. Maybe it's a helpful reminder. Sea of Galilee. Uh, let's see. We're going to be viewing this from the, uh, from the eastern bank. And so let's say we're on the eastern bank right here. Here's the sea. Looks like this. Um, along the other side is kind of, kind of cliffs over here. And then it kind of sweeps around, and there's this hill that moves up this way. And here is what we call the Rosh Pinasil, but not important. This is where this is where the Sermon on the Mount happens, right there. That's where Jesus sits and he teaches his disciples, right here. Boom. Down here, right down here, is the city of Capernaum with some really nice houses. Kind of right on that um, northwest corner of, of, of the Sea of Galilee, right there, boom. Jordan is here. That's how it all happens. In other words, if this is close. Jesus comes down, it's, this is a very plausible kind of course of events, that Jesus would come down somewhere, as he comes down the mountain, there is the, uh, the side of this hill, there's the leper, heals him, heads now into the city of Capernaum, that's right there. And that's where this thing happens with the centurion. Now, what's a centurion? This is a centurion who is a Roman soldier, one with people below him. Um, he's in charge of a hundred men. And uh, this is a centurion with faith. Just like we have a leper with faith here, we have a centurion with faith now. And, and indeed, if we were going to draw him, we'd draw him green like these other disciples. And why? It's because of what he says. Uh, Lord, Lord, he says. Remember that word, Lord. He calls him Lord, just like the leopard, just like the disciples do. My servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And he says, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. So in the same way that a uh, leper came to him with faith, which is surprising, uh, so the centurion comes to him and he has, has faith in the same way in calling him Lord. Now Jesus responds with this phrase that in your Bible probably says something like, I will go and heal him. There is a, that probably half and half, the people who translate this from the Greek uh, kind of disagree on how this should go. Uh, Jesus' response is not just, I will go and heal him. In, in the Greek, it, it has an emphatic I or which we render often, I myself. You see that later um, in verse 9 when, when, the, when the centurion says, for, I, for myself am a man under, I myself am a man under authority. That's an emphatic thing there. In the same way, in verse 7, Jesus says, I myself. Now, uh, that's not rendered in our, in our text. And, and a lot of people think that it, it might be an indication to us that Jesus is actually asking this or saying these words in the form of a question. So instead of, I will go and heal him, he says, should I myself go and heal him? And what's, why is that helpful? Why would it matter if Jesus is, is asking a question? Now, there's a few reasons. The first is that uh, he could be trying to understand better what the faith of this centurion is. What is it? Why are you, just, why are you telling me this? You want me to go and heal him? Uh, and, and the reason for that is that this is actually crazy. Now, we read the scriptures and Jesus healing, and just a week ago, we celebrated Jesus rising from the dead, and, and we can lose the context of just the, the insanity of what's happening here. Jesus went up on, on a hillside and he taught these incredible things that we've been going through for the last few months. Incredible things that are just shaking the world, right? Then on his way down, he stops and he heals a leper. It's crazy. Now another one stops him and asks him to heal him. This isn't even a Jew, though. And so it's crazy enough that someone might be, might be asking Jesus to heal uh, his, his servant, but it's even more incredible that this is not a Jew. This is not an Israelite. Jesus is the Israelite Messiah, and this Gentile, this foreigner, this Roman, in some way or another, has come to him and, and, and begins to ask him to heal his servant. That's incredible. And it shows that this faith 
is not just for these, as Jesus is going to get to in a minute. This is a, a faith and the benefits of it that could be for, for anyone. So Jesus asking, should I go, should I go and heal him? It, it is a way to verify what, it, what kind of faith does this centurion have? Uh, it's not that he's reluctant, but he wants to know more about what this guy believes because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Of course, it does to Christ, but it doesn't to any of us. And it's worth, from Jesus' perspective, uh, kind of teasing this out. Now, as, as, he, as he goes then into this discourse, Jesus begins to understand more and more, at least we begin to understand more and more, what it is that's actually happening here. The centurion replies, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Look back up at chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. This authority that Jesus teaches with is familiar to the centurion. He has something like it in his own life. I tell him to jump, and he says, how high? I tell him, go, and he goes. I tell him, come, and he comes. You, Jesus, have authority also. And so it's not just that things obey you or that people should obey you, although they should. It's instead that, that what you say goes, and indeed, what you say even enacts things. It makes them happen. So if you say that he is healed, he will be healed. That's the sort of faith that the centurion has, and, and that's how he understands authority to work. If you've got real authority, what you say actually makes things happen. It's not just that they obey you, although they do. Jesus, your sort of authority is even greater. It's the kind of, it's performative authority and that it actually performs actions in and of itself. And that's the kind of faith that he has. And that's the kind of faith that causes Jesus Christ, the one through which the world was spoken into existence, to be astonished, to be stunned, to be marked, to marvel, as yours might say, to marvel and say, Truly, he says, I've never seen faith like this anywhere I've been. I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel such a great faith. Ever. This man understands what my authority is like. This man understands what my voice can do. This man understands what God intends to do with his Messiah. This Gentile, this Roman, this centurion, He's not small-minded in the sense that he thinks that Jesus is going to just come and be the kind of Savior he wants him to be, right? The way Judas did. He's not that kind of believer. He's got a very different sort of faith, one that's open to God's entire creative work in the world, including the way that he brings about our salvation in Christ Jesus. And we know that because that's what Jesus explains next. He says, I say to you that many will come from the east and from the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. From the east and from the west is not just Jews from the east and Jews from the west, but rather people, all people, will come to this feast. People are from all over will come to this feast. And of course, we get that image in the book of Revelation uh, when, we're to, when we read about people from all nations who are, are turning in worship to God and all tribes, and you get this image of all colors, even, of people. That's what this banquet will look like. And that's what Jesus turns. So he marvels and he turns, he's stunned or he's astonished. He turns to the crowds and he says, this banquet is going to be incredible. Because people, anyone who believes like this one does, this centurion does, will be there with me at this final banquet. But then in the same breath, he turns to these Jews and he says, But be aware, the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be people who are from the very kingdom. They believe in, in their kind of their lineage and their, 
history in, in their um, 23 and me tests that will not be there at that final banquet. Instead, they will be thrown out where there is much gnashing of teeth, which is an image that Jesus uses in Matthew to talk about whatever it means to not be with him for eternity. So in the same breath, we get this incredible gift, this incredible blessing, this incredible image of this banquet that is for all of us. And yet the warning as well, that if you don't have the kind of faith that throws you down on your knees before Jesus, if you don't have the kind of faith that acknowledges that your house is not worthy of his presence, if you don't have the kind of faith that believes that he could say, he's healed, she's healed, and she will be, this banquet isn't for you. It's an incredible, incredible first demonstration of Jesus' authority, these two interactions. Jesus doesn't leave out the kind of the thing we want to see, the end of the story, the happy ending, right? He says, go, your, your servant's healed, will be healed, and within the, that hour he is. And that's kind of the incredible last thing about it, is that Jesus, um, we kind of have two kinds of people. And uh, that doesn't work on that for some reason. We kind of have two kinds of people, but we all start with the same sort uh, at the same sort of place. Um, we have needs, and we have um, now options at this point. We can have needs with faith or needs without faith. And the crowds generally take this path. But here we've seen two take this path. Needs with and faith with Jesus and Matthew so far have led to healing. And Jesus has made it pretty clear in this section that needs with no faith lead to gnashing teeth. And Jesus makes you clean. He makes these people clean. He heals these people. He brings them from death to life. He brings you from death to life. And it's acknowledging your need for a Savior. Uh, and, and then turning to that Savior in faith that leads to your healing. And so that's uh, this incredible first image we have. Jesus has spoken with authority in the Sermon on the Mount, and now in these two healings, he's demonstrated that very authority. And we've even been given examples from this leper and from this centurion of what it would look like if we had faith. It's an incredible gift we have here. Let us cling to it as we go now into our weeks, praying that we would be people who acknowledge our needs as all do, but would acknowledge also uh, Christ Jesus and, and have faith that leads to healing. Uh, we love you, church. We miss you. Uh, we'll be back next week as we kind of head into the, to the next, the, the healing uh, of, uh, we have more healing coming. Jesus is going to heal many next, uh, including a mother-in-law, which is, makes, make, just makes for a good story. So uh, we'll see you soon. God's peace be with you. Love you. Bye.